Good morning. Good morning. It's really good to be with you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ryan Hansen. I'm the uh, Minister of Visitation uh, here, and I'm always glad to be among you, um, whether it's a Sunday or any other day. But I'm happy uh, that while Pastor Matt is away this week, that I can come and share the word with you. Um, I want to give you some news to the community uh, this week. A, a, a few things, but before we talk about the schedule, uh, Pastor Matt messaged me uh, yesterday, I think it was, and wanted me to let you know um, that uh, Libby and Alex Turek, who we've been praying for for a long while now, um, had their daughter Hazel on the 21st. And um, they're very excited about that, and very excited for you all to, to meet her. And um, so hopefully that will be happening uh, some, sometime soon, but that is good news. Um, a couple things on the schedule this week, or, or upcoming, not necessarily this week. Uh, the next Church at Work Sunday will be August 14th. The Church at Work Sunday, where after uh, the worship gathering, we will get together in the various uh, ministry teams and ministry groups um, and coordinate uh, that ministry of the church. That will be happening August 14th. Um, next Sunday is the church picnic. Next Sunday um, at Union Park. And hopefully the weather will be good. Um, I think the backup location is here. If uh, it happens to be raining, uh, but uh, next Sunday, and actually there's a little more information on that, and I want to give that to you. Um, starting at 10 a.m., uh, worship will be at Union Park, which is located between State, 7th Park, and 6th Streets, just right over, I don't remember which way to point, but that, that way, <laughs> or that way, okay. Um, yes, it's east. Um, so the driveway into the park can be used for dropping people or food off, but you must park on any of the surrounding streets. You won't be able to park in the park itself. Bring a friend. Um, the church will provide a main dish, lemonade and water, and so you're asked to bring additional side dishes, desserts, and or beverages to share if you're able. Uh, benches are limited, so if you have some portable seating, it would be a good thing to bring. Um, with you, or uh, blankets. I can't sit on the ground for that long, though, so I need a chair. Um, and in, in case of rain, uh, we'll be moving over here. All are welcome to attend, and, and uh, please join us even if you can't arrive right at 10. You're welcome to come anytime uh, after 10 to the uh, picnic on July 31st. So that will be fun. Uh, September 10th, uh, I wanted to let you know about the mural painting. Um, there's a mural going up. Again, I don't know which way to point. <laughs> Somewhere over there, yes. Um, a beautiful mural that's been uh, in the works and planned. Uh, it's going to be uh, a, a part of the church facility here, and it will be a, another addition to the beautiful art that we have all around the community. So, um, September 10th is when that is occurring. Um, and then next week at the picnic, um, we will be talking a little bit about the warming shelter that uh, the church community is beginning to uh, put into place for this upcoming winter. So if you want to learn more about how you can get involved with the ministry of the warming shelter, um, make sure you come next week to the picnic to learn more. That'll be a good opportunity to hear. So that is, oh, one more announcement that's more um, immediate. The uh, TV screens, the monitors are not working this morning. We don't know why, but they're just not working. So you'll, if you don't have a worship folder, you're gonna want one of those this morning because uh, they're in the back. Um, you'll need the, the words to the songs on the paper today. But everything is still streaming uh, online, so um, just know that those are, are blank because they're not working today. Um, 
So again, welcome this morning, and to, to those who are online, uh, it is good to be together. Please stand in the body of your spirit, and let us gather for worship. Take a, just a moment to take a deep breath, focus your minds and your hearts on our Lord this morning. We are here for Jesus. Would you pray with me together, please? Holy God, we acknowledge your presence here and indeed that your presence preceded us here today. That you're here to meet with us, to draw us closer into your life, into your love, into the beauty of your holiness. And we praise you. And we give you the honor that is due your name because you have made us, because you know us, because you have called us. You have rescued us, you have loved us into the people that we are today, and you are loving us into the people that we are becoming. And you have gathered this community and knit us together and are knitting us together. And you have become our friend. And we're so thankful for that. We're thankful for your goodness, thankful for your love and for your mercy, and we give you thanks for all your good gifts, and we offer these prayers in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Well, the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day. And would you um, share that peace of Christ with each other this morning in the spirit of God's love?
Would you please join in singing the song, A Prophet Woman Broke a Jar? which I've only been able to follow online thus far. I haven't been able to be here with you in person before today um, through the series, but uh, the series that we're calling In Memory of Her, uh, which is a, a quotation from what Jesus says about the woman who we've just sung about, the woman who broke the jar of perfume on uh, Jesus' feet and... Uh, began to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair. Um, and when she was criticized, you'll remember uh, from a few weeks ago, um, Jesus defended her and said, you know, leave her alone, what she's done is beautiful, and um, 
From now on, he says, whenever the gospel story is told, whenever the good news is shared with anyone, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. In other words, you, Jesus seems to be saying to us that you can't tell the gospel story without this reference to the faithfulness of this woman's witness. And indeed, I think what he means in an expanded way is you can't tell the gospel story without reference, without talking about the lives and the faithful witness of a whole host of women in the scriptural texts. And yet, um, she remains unnamed. And we have, um, likewise, tended to overlook or forget about the immense witness of the lives of women in Scripture. And so that's what we're tracing in this series. We've been for several weeks, and we will for several weeks more. And um, I have to admit, uh, even for someone who's been a pastor for a good long while now, I grew up as a Bible quizzer. I have a PhD in Biblical Studies. I teach uh, Bible classes online. I teach every year a class on the Gospels. I'm not immune to this overlooking and forgetfulness myself. So, a while back when uh, Pastor Matt asked me to sit down with him and kind of talk through some ideas for this sermon series, uh, with him, we were talking about some of the various women in the text that we might preach about. And when Joanna herself came up, whom, whom we've read about this morning, um, we've read in several different texts, Luke 8, when talking about uh, these women followers of Jesus who not only follow faithfully, but also um, provide out of their resources um, to support Jesus' ministry. And then we read about um, Joanna's presence at the empty tomb. Also, uh, she's not named, but she's almost certainly present at the crucifixion. And then we read this little text from Romans 16 with a different name, uh, but we'll get into that, why that more than likely is also Joanna, even though she's named Junia in Romans 16. I have to admit, when we brought her up, and we did what uh, everyone does when you want to learn some more information about a person, whether that person is alive or dead, uh, you do a Google, Google search on that person just to see what comes up. And I remember when we did this, when we were sitting down to talk about this and um, talked about just the fact that Joanna was uh, involved in the court of Herod. And that took me aback. I said, oh, really? And um, how many times have I read this passage, right, from Luke 8? Um, many times over, and um, there it is right in the text. She was the wife of Herod's servant, Chusa. But I had just breezed over that, and it took me aback even when, when I was sitting with Pastor Matt thinking about this series, and I had to stop because though I've read this text many times over, I hadn't really taken in that fact. And, and really, what, what stopped me in my tracks was that I realized I had read these texts so many times, but I had never taken the time to stop and imagine Joanna's life. How many times have I taken the time to stop and think about Peter's life, to think about Paul's life, to think about James' life? Timothy's life, all these other people that are mentioned and named in the New Testament, but I hadn't stopped to imagine and, and slow down with Joanna's life. Now, I mentioned imagining her life because I think that imagination is key, and I'm going to talk about imagination a lot this morning. I think imagination is key. Because imagining Joanna's life is important. But also, 
I think she exhibits, when we, when we slow down and pay attention to her life, when we maybe imagine what life would have been like for her with the body of evidence that we're given, I think actually in her life, holy imagination plays this large role that can be a witness to our lives of Christian faithfulness today. So we're going to talk a lot about imagination today. That's what we're going to do for a little while. The practice of imagination. Imagining what Joanna's life might have been like. Maybe a little bit of fan fiction. Um, you know, we have to fill in some gaps that we may not know. But then we're also going to pay attention to her own practice of holy imagination which translated into her dangerous, her risky faithfulness to the way of Jesus in a world that was not hospitable to the way of Jesus, but also not hospitable to women, and not hospitable to women who were in leadership, which she clearly was. So her holy imagination might be an inspiration for us, for our own practice of holy imagination. So first of all, I want to look at Joanna and Herod's court. That's what we get from Luke chapter 8, the first three verses. Soon afterward, Jesus traveled through the cities and villages, preaching and proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. And the twelve were with him, along with some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Among them were Mary Magdalene, who we know quite well, although... Um, she has gained some reputation that might not be worthy of her. I won't go into that. Um, but she's, well, I'll, I'll go into it briefly. She's often been labeled as a prostitute, which nowhere in Scripture will you find that about Mary Magdalene. Um, what we do know is what the text tells us, that she had seven demons that had been cast out of her from Jesus. But nowhere else you'll never find it. Mary labeled um, prostitute. So um, there might be reasons why, uh, why people would want to label her and dismiss her, but she was in fact a very uh, prominent leader in the early church, uh, one of the first witnesses to the resurrection, the first Easter preacher alongside Joanna herself. Um, but among them were Mar Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the wife of Herod's servant Chusa, Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. So what do we know about Joanna? Well, we know that she was healed of a sickness. That's what the text tells us. These women who were healed of sicknesses, we know that she was a follower of Jesus. We know that she was a patron of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is rambling around the country with 12 apostles and many more people also that followed alongside Jesus. Kind of a a motley crew of, uh, you know, outsiders, former um, sick people, um, people who were um, not wealthy um, all the time, and uh, just a whole bunch of people that you wouldn't expect to all be hanging around together. And you wouldn't necessarily always expect Jesus to be hanging around, but those were his people. And he's out rambling around the countryside with these folks. How does he do that? Well, the kindness and hospitality of these women who out of their resources provided means for them to buy food when they needed it. Provided means for them to find shelter when they needed it. Um, we don't have to think about that in the ministry of Jesus, but when you're walking around for three years, uh, you know, you don't have an RV, you don't have a motor home, you need resources. And we know that Joanna, Mary perhaps, Susanna, some of these women had some resources and out of those resources they provided for the mission of the kingdom of God. That's significant. So this is what we know about Joanna. But again, the thing that stopped me up short is that she is the wife of Herod's servant or steward, Chusa. Now this is a pretty prominent position in Herod's court, a steward or a servant who would kind of uh, be in charge of the, the resources that Herod had accrued. This is not an in insignificant position. And so we have to think about Joanna and Herod's court. 
So when we think about that, I think it's interesting that this text in Luke 8 is framed on either side by stories of Herod's court. Um, and we should pay attention to those. So the first story comes in Luke chapter 7, one chapter ahead of this, where um, we hear John sending some disciples to Jesus saying, are you the one? Are you the one we've waited for? Are you the one who is to come? And um, Jesus answers back to them to take this message back to John um, that uh, Jesus had just cured many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits, and had given sight to many who were blind. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. And we learn, not from Luke, Luke omits this little detail, but Matthew tells us that when John sent these folks to Jesus, he was a little bit desperate because he was in prison because Herod had imprisoned him. So, that's one of the things we hear about Herod's court. Herod has imprisoned John the Baptist for speaking truth to power, and John is a bit desperate because he's, he needs to know, is Jesus the one? Is Jesus the one that's going to come? I need to know if I'm suffering for a purpose, suffering for a cause. Um, and then the next story, the other frame of Herod that we get in Luke, um, Luke omits some interesting details, maybe because he's just trying to uh, not step on too many toes. But we do hear that Herod killed John while he was in prison. Um, so this is from Luke 9, on the other side of chapter 8, which we just read. Now Herod the ruler heard all that had taken place, and he was perplexed, because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the ancient prophets had arisen. Herod said, John, I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he tried to see Jesus. Okay, so we don't get the, the nitty-gritty gory details of how that happened to John in Herod's court. But, but Luke does acknowledge that Herod beheaded John. Now, I was talking to Anne uh, this week. She asked, what are you going to preach about? And I, I said, you know, I've been preaching on Joanna, and I've just been thinking about some interesting things related to Joanna, and I wondered if she was present in Herod's court for this party it's likely that she was, because this party would have been thrown for all of Herod's people, all of the hangers-on, all of the people that he wanted to impress. This party where Herod's wife, whom he had taken from his own brother, this is what John called him out for, it's what got John into trouble, into prison, um, in which Herod's wife didn't like John, uh, but her daughter danced for Herod, and it pleased him, and um, he basically promised up to half his kingdom. He would give her whatever she wanted. And so the mother and daughter conspire a little bit and say, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. Now I know we're veering into uh, strange things, so when I talked to Anne this week, she's like, oh, I don't know if you want to get into all that. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan, and there are some gruesome moments in that involving heads as well. Um, and, and those movies are rated PG-13, so I, I, I gather that we're veering into PG-13 territory this morning. Uh, but if we're in Lord of the Rings territory, I feel like that's probably all right. Um, but um, I wonder if Joanna was present at that party. That certainly doesn't seem to be a space that was super hospitable to women. It doesn't seem to be a space where uh, women's dignity was upheld and honored. Um, instead, exploitation seems to be the name of the game there. Um, but I wonder if she was present for that. And then last week, as I was looking at some things, I came across an icon, which I have never seen 
another one of these gruesome moments, an icon of Joanna, uh, where she is recovering the head of John the Baptist, which has been, you know, kind of tossed out somewhere. I don't know if that has any basis in the tradition or any historical accuracy, but I thought it was a really interesting icon to talk about her kind of dangerous allegiance to an alternative kingdom. Because I think the framing of Herod here in Joanna's story is important. We know what kind of king Herod is. This is not the same Herod that tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. This is that Herod's son. Um, but like father, like son, these are not good kings, not good rulers. And so this image of Joanna going out to recover John's head it would be a risky move. This is an enemy of the king. This is one who has been executed for being an enemy of the king. Um, but that, that she would show that kind of bravery and courage to go out and align herself with a different way. And then the text that we read, she's a follower of Jesus. Jesus is an alternative king to Herod. The crucifixion stories make that clear. Jesus is not an insurrectionist. He's not trying to violently overthrow Herod's kingdom, but he does present an alternative kingship. And he preaches the kingdom of God, which is an alternative kingdom to the unjust, exploitative kingdom of Herod. Okay, so uh, that's interesting. To me, that's fascinating about Joanna, that she has this kind of courage to be this disciple, this follower of an alternative king, of an alternative kingdom. And... Uh, And she provides for the mission of this alternative kingdom. Maybe she was one of the 70 when Jesus sends out 70 disciples to proclaim the kingdom, to do the ministry and the work of the kingdom. Uh, she may have been, likely was, one of those 70 that were sent out in pairs. Okay, that's it. That was already a lot more than I ever have thought about when I've read this text but the kind of risky faithfulness that she shows as being in the court of Herod and yet transferring her allegiance to a different kind of king. But then we see Joanna, I think we actually see her at the cross, but we definitely see her at the empty tomb when we read from Luke 14, 10. Again, just a very brief verse, but there's a little bit more there too. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. She is uh, what the Christian tradition has called a myrrh bearer. She brought the spices to the tomb. Uh, she is coming to the tomb on this first Easter Sunday morning, and in doing so, she's pictured as an ideal disciple. This is what Luke wants us to see. She is the image of an ideal disciple disciple, because she's with Jesus all the way to the cross. Um, it, Luke 23, 49 tells us that the women, as Jesus is dying, the women who followed him there from Galilee were standing there bearing witness, watching these events. So she's there at the cross, and she's there through the cross. She remains faithful even through the crucifixion all the way through to the tomb. And then when she comes, when these women come to the empty tomb, they are surprised by joy and they are surprised by hope at the empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday morning. And so, Joanna didn't even, didn't only have the holy imagination that it takes to be a follower of this alternative king. But she then is given this holy imagination by the power of resurrection to become one of our first Easter preachers. Don't let anyone tell you that women can't preach because when God wanted to select the first people who would preach the message of Jesus' resurrection, they were women. 
Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women who were with them, preached to the apostles the resurrection message. So, that's what we read in our text. There's a little bit more there, though. Um, as these women come and share the message of resurrection with the apostles, the men, the apostles, who are men, don't believe them. And uh, the gospel tells us that they thought, and this is a polite translation, they thought it was an idle tale. Um, that's how one of the translations gets it. Now we're very into PG-13 uh, territory again. Um, let me just say that that word in the Greek, that Greek word is leros, and that word could be helpfully translated uh, into something, the polite uh, way for us to talk about it would be, they thought it was a bunch of cow manure. And I'll let you imagine uh, maybe what the more rough translation of that would be. They thought it was Leros. They thought it was a bunch of cow manure. What are you talking about? He's raised from the dead. You guys are crazy. Oh, but they were right. They were right. So Joanna um, not only had the holy imagination to be a follower of Jesus all the way through death, unto Easter. But she had the holy imagination to continue to preach the resurrection message, even when the other people who should have known better, who followed Jesus the whole way along with her, said, what are you talking about? There's no way. She continued to preach with boldness and holy imagination. That's amazing. I think that's just awesome. What a witness to us. Okay, so our third text. We jump all the way to Paul's letter to the Romans, all the way to the end, where Paul is greeting all these people in Rome that he knows. He doesn't know the whole church. He hasn't been with the church, but he knows a lot of people in the church. And one of those folks, two of these folks, he says hello to, are Andronicus and Junia, my relatives and my fellow prisoners. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Junia, who is this person? Why would we connect Junia with Joanna? Well, um, one of my favorite uh, New Testament scholars, Richard Balcom, it was one of the uh, people that actually connected uh, Joanna to Junia. Uh, and the reason being that uh, clearly she's an important person in the church, She's called an apostle, she's called prominent among the apostles, and she was in Christ before Paul. So that means she was, she was part of this at ground level. That would describe Joanna, uh, certainly a follower of Jesus since Galilee, one who is portrayed as an ideal disciple at the crucifixion, one who is portrayed as an ideal disciple at the resurrection, and one who was portrayed as the first Easter preacher, the one who had to tell the, the apostles that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Okay, so, it also helps that Junia, the, the Greco-Roman name, is an equivalent name to the Aramaic, more Hebraic name, Joanna. You can almost hear it, Joanna, Junia. Joanna, Junia. So someone, if they're in Palestine in the first century, might go by their Jewish name, Joanna. But if they're in Rome, or somewhere out in the wider Roman Empire, they might go by their Greek name, Junia. Um, kind of, I, when we went on a mission trip, when I was in middle school, my church went on a mission trip to Quito, Ecuador, and um, my, one of my best friend's dad was named Paul. We knew him as Paul. When he went to Quito, Ecuador, everybody called him Pablo. Same thing, right? Different name, same name, same person. It could very well be that Joanna and Junia are the same person. Um, and, and Junia here is mentioned as a minister and a leader of the early church. Against all odds. Um, you know, Paul has a bad reputation when it comes to women. What he says about women in ministry 
women as preachers in the early church. He gets a bad rap about this. But actually, when you look at the evidence for, for Paul and women, let me just name you some names, and then you can go look these folks up. Uh, Phoebe, the one who carries the letter to the Romans and who probably reads it to the Romans. She is, uh, she is a deacon of the early church, a leader of the church in Corinth. Priscilla, who Paul calls a co-worker. She's a leader in the early church. She's also named right before this in Romans 16. A woman named Mary is named in Romans 16, who is uh, imaged as a co-worker of Paul. Junia, Tryphena, and Tryphosa, who Paul says they work very hard in the Lord. That's, a, that's the language of church leadership. Co-workers with Paul, Tryphena and Tryphosa, probably twins. Chloe in 1 Corinthians. In Philippians, we hear about Euodia and Syntyche, two women who were leaders in the church. We don't often think about them or talk about them, but they are women leaders in the church. And people, so, so Junia is a, a leader against all odds because people think that Paul hasn't, uh, hasn't elevated women in leadership, but it looks like he actually has when we look at the names that Paul mentions. Um, but also, it was a world in which uh, women in leadership was not a common thing. So Junia would be a leader against all odds. Um, but the New Testament church was this institution like any other in the Greco-Roman world, where men and women, enslaved people and free, rich and poor, um, Jew and Gentile, all would gather together as equals under the Lordship of Christ. No other institution, no other group of people was doing that in the ancient world. But the first Christians were doing that. And so, though the rest of the culture uh, would have looked askance at Junia's leadership in the church, at Joanna's leadership in the church, she was a leader against all odds. But she's also had to face the tough odds of some aspects of Christian tradition and history, because Junia has actually, at times, been erased from history. Um, the early church, who all, you know, many of them spoke Greek as their native language, knew she was a woman. But later on, when women in leadership became controversial and um, the patriarchy kind of tried to take over, uh, there began to be some questioning about Junia. Could this be a woman? And they tried to make this a name of uh, Junius, right? That would be a male's name in that culture. The only problem is there is no record everywhere you look, in any document, any inscription that we have, there is no record of the name Junius. The name Junius does not exist in the ancient world despite some biblical translators trying to make Junia into Junius. Ju if that was the case, this would be the only person that we know about in all of ancient history who would be named Junius. It's like a made-up name. It doesn't exist. But Junia, if you look at the ancient name record, we know Junia everywhere. There's a Junia named all over the place, right? In various settings, various places. So Junia, we know, is a name that's very common. And so, um, if, you, uh, if you're reading a new translation of the New Testament, or you're reading a commentary on Romans, always flip to the back of Romans, or flip to the back of that commentary on Romans, and see what they say about Junia. Have they translated it correctly? Or are they trying to cover up? Um, that's really important. Um, and, and it's important to hear Junia's name. So Junia's holy imagination that led her to be a follower of Jesus led her all the way to Rome, where she was an early leader in the Jesus movement. A community, like I said, that was unlike any other in the Roman world, where all these people, these very different people, would gather together as equals under the lordship of Jesus. For someone I hadn't taken enough time to slow down and imagine her life, in these past several weeks, as I've thought about 
her life and given her life more thought and imagined her life, she has become one of my favorite followers of Jesus, one of my favorite leaders of the early church over the past few weeks. And so, as we've taken this practice of imagination, I pray that we might all be inspired by our sister, Joanna, that we too might be given the holy imagination to say no to the oppressive and unjust systems that we are tangled up in. To say to the world's kings who imagine that they run the world and that the world should serve them, that we would say, no, thank you. We follow King Jesus. That we might be given the holy imagination to say, there's got to be a kingdom of God alternative in the world. And we're going to seek that. And then to seek and to work for and build that alternative together. Male and female, black and white, rich and poor. Build it together under King Jesus. And I pray that we might be given Joanna's holy imagination in the face of the death-dealing powers of the world that we might remember that the tomb that she discovered was empty and that death does not get the last word in this world. May we have enough bold, holy imagination to be people of hope. Even when others tell us that it's an idle tale, that it's cow manure, that it's leros, that we would be a people who trust in the power of resurrection over the power of crucifixion. That we would be a people who trust in the power of God's life over the power of sin and death. And I pray that we might be given the holy imagination of Junia, who against all odds was an apostle, really, prominent and well-known among the apostles of the early church, whom Paul regarded with respect. There might just be someone here with us or listening today online who God is calling to the ministry of church leadership. Uh, you may feel that call but also, oftentimes, if you're a woman in the world, you may feel that the odds are stacked against you. Sometimes you can feel that way as a man as well. Well, God called Junia when the odds were stacked against her. And God granted her the holy imagination to follow Jesus into an unlikely future. And I just wonder if it's so easy for me to overlook Joanna and Junia. Um, so easy for the disciples to dismiss the resurrection message. How often have we throughout church history missed out on the voices of leadership that God has chosen because we've dismissed, because we've ignored, because we have not given the time to listen to the words, to the faithful witness, to the lives of women, followers of Jesus, whom God has raised up for church leadership, but they've been silenced or ignored or forgotten. What have we missed out on? That's the kind of holy imagination that I want us to cultivate so that we seek to not miss out on that, because God is calling people for ministry. May not be pastoral ministry, maybe some other kind of ministry, but God is calling people to leadership and ministry in the church. God continues to do that. God is calling women and men to leadership. Let us not miss out on that. Let us cultivate this practice of holy imagination. I pray that what God would grant all of us, the holy imagination to listen and respond to the voice of Jesus today.
Let us sing the song, Take My Life, and let it be consecrated. This is the time when we will uh, respond with generosity as God has first given to us. We return what God entrusted to us. Um, as we receive the offering, you can please bring your offering to the front offering plate. Could we bring the offering? God, you are the generous giver of all good and perfect gifts. And we want to demonstrate our thankfulness and gratitude to you and our willingness to participate in your mission in the world. We pray that you would multiply these gifts, uh, that the goodness in our community would expand by the power of your Holy Spirit and us and our partnership with you in that work. We pray this in Jesus' name.
realized I have a, somehow have a different copy of our order of service, and we, um, I knew the prayers of the people were supposed to be there, but I didn't see it in my order. So, um, we're going to pray right now after the offering. Um, are there any requests to share? Okay, we'll keep you in prayer. I have some friends that had a house fire recently, so their their family is okay, that's good, but they have a long way of repair ahead of them where they're going to be out of their home uh, for a good long while. Um, so keep them... Okay, let's pray together, please. Holy God, um, we come here uh, inspired by the holy boldness of our sister, Joanna, Junia. Um, and we, we want to be faithful like her. We want to be uh, listeners, of your vo listeners to your voice and, and, and obedient responders to your call like her. And so we pray that you would speak, and as you speak, open our ears, enable us to hear you, and draw closer to you. Um, you are good, and you love us, and you cause us to grow, and to be more and more like Jesus each day. We pray that we would open our lives to that work, that we would, too, uh, open our lives uh, to others in generosity and hospitality and love kindness. God, there are uh, needs, uh, both that have been spoken here this morning, uh, that have possibly been entered into uh, the comment section of the live stream. There are needs that have been spoken. There are needs that have not been spoken here. And we trust you um, to work in our lives for our good. And so we raise these, um, these requests that have been offered here, whether it be traveling or um, living situations, people embarking on a new journey in the military, people who have, have to be out of their home uh, for the time being. Uh, there are people who are sick there are also uh, offerings of praise that we give you for the birth of Hazel, uh, for recovery from illness. And we continue to remember um, Anne Gold and many others who are um, dealing with, with health difficulties right now. God, we trust you, and we trust you to lead us 
into life everlasting. And so we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us in whatever language is closest to our heart. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we pray this prayer of uh, sending, God, that you would uh, send us out with renewed imaginations to see the possibilities of the kingdom of God alive and at work in our neighborhoods, among the people we know, among our state, among our nation, that you are renewing the face of the earth. Give us the imagination to see that. Give us the imagination to become eager participants with you in that work. Send us out by the power of your Holy Spirit inspired by the witness of our sister, Joanna, to be faithful followers of King Jesus out into the world. We pray. Amen. Would you please stand for the blessing? I'm learning as a participant in this community that we um, hold one hand up because we are receivers of God's blessing, and we hold one hand out because we are also likewise givers of God's blessing. We receive God's blessing and we give it as we go. Um, may the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, that your imaginations may be inspired and renewed just as our sister Joanna's was, that you may be faithful followers of Jesus Christ out in the world today and each day.